Okay, let's talk about the axioms of probability. So if we have some sample space S and we have some event A occurring, we say that the probability that an event A occurs is given as P of A. So this is a function that assigns a probability to an event. Now, whenever you're looking at sample spaces and events, there's some axioms that should be satisfied. So the first one says for any A, the probability of A occurring is greater or equal to zero. In other words, let's say something never happens, it could be zero. If it happens 50% of the time, it'd be 0.5. If it always happens, it would be one. So let's say we have a six-sided die, one, two, three, four, five, and six, and we want the probability of rolling a seven. Well, that's gonna be zero. The event seven can't occur, but it's still gonna be greater or equal to zero in this case. If you look at the entire sample space, the probability of some event in the sample space occurring should be one. So when we add up all of our events um, that are disjoint, we should be getting one in this case if it covers the entire sample space. So what I mean by this is let's say we have some event A and some event not A. This whole thing should equal one. In other words, the probability of A occurring or not A occurring should be one in this case. So it's like the uh, probability of rolling one through six. Each of those events are independent, one, two, three, four, five, six, but when we put them all together, the odds of rolling one through six should be 100%. Finally, if all of our events are disjoint, then the probability of any of those events occurring, so A1 or A2 or dot, 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 all the way up to AN, is just gonna be the sum of events. So to think about this in terms of our die rolling, Imagine I ask you the probability of rolling an even number. Well, this should be the probability of rolling two plus the probability of rolling four plus the probability of rolling six because each of these are independent events. So that's what the three axioms are saying. And we can derive some interesting things from this. So the first thing we can derive is that the probability of the empty set is equal to zero. So this empty set is just a null event. This is an event where nothing happens. Uh, in other words, there's, there's no event there. So that probability should be zero. So we're gonna use the third axiom to do this. And we're gonna say, okay, imagine we have all of these events where nothing occurs. So A1, A2, and this just continues on forever. Well, one thing we know about the empty set is that the intersection of the empty set with the empty set is the empty set itself. Therefore, these two events are disjoint. So now if we think about the probability of A1 or A2 or dot, 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 all of these occurring, this should just be the sum of all of your AIs occurring. So specifically the probabilities of all of these AIs occurring. So the only way for this to happen is if, well, this is zero because none of these events should be occurring and therefore we're gonna get the probability of the empty set or the null event is equal to zero. That's not going to happen. All right, uh, so that's the first thing that we can prove. So if we are ever talking about the probability that you know we don't have an event, that should be zero. The second thing we can prove is that the probability of event A occurring plus the probability of not A occurring is equal to one. So we just saw this with a little diagram here, A and A bar. If this is our sample space, you can see that this covers the entire sample space. So what we're going to do with axiom three is say, okay, our event A1 will be A, our event A2 is going to be A bar. We know that the intersection of these is nothing. There's nothing in common between these two, therefore these are going to be disjoint events. Now what we also know is that the probability of the sample space is equal to one. And because these are disjoint that cover the entire sample space, this is going to be equal to the probability of A occurring plus the probability of not A occurring. So 
this right here shows us that the probability of A plus the probability of not A is equal to one. This is usually more useful in its other form, which is that one minus the probability of event A occurring is the probability that A bar occurs or not A occurs. So this formula tends to be a little bit more useful in application. Now we can prove one more thing. This one's a little bit more challenging. We can prove that the union of A and B, so the probability of the union occurring, is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersection B. So what this means here is let's say we want to figure out what the probability of this whole space is. Well, if we just have A here and we just take B here, what we're noticing is that this middle space here is being added twice. So this is A intersection B. So because it's being added twice, we need to subtract it once. So PA plus PB minus PA intersection B, and that gives us the probability of A union B. But we should probably prove this. So there's a couple interesting facts that we can take advantage of here. And that is, if we think about what B is in this diagram, B can be thought of as two components. There's a portion of B here, which is equivalent to B intersection A bar. And there's also a portion of B here in this bit, which is equal to B intersection A. So if we add these two together, what we get is, in our diagram, the probability of B occurring. So we have one fact here. We have that the probability of B is equal to the probability of B intersection A bar plus the probability of B intersection A. So that's one fact. Another fact that we have is that if we think about A union B, so I can write this here, this is going to be equivalent to draw two things here. So two things that can be equivalent to. We can think of it as being part of this space, which is B intersection A bar, just like what we saw above, plus everything in A. So the probability of A union B occurring is the same thing as the probability of B intersection A bar plus the probability of A. So we can do some substitution here. I just want to rewrite this equation. So what we're going to do is say that the probability of B intersection A bar is equal to the probability of A union B minus the probability of A. So I'm going to take this formula here and I'm going to plug it in to this formula here. And what my result's going to be is that the probability of B is equal to the probability of A union B minus the probability of A plus the probability of B intersection A. So if we can do some rearrangement, we're going to get something that looks very similar to our formula at the top. That is that the probability of A union B is going to be equal to PB plus E of A minus e inter, uh, the probability of B intersection A, which is the same thing as A intersection B. So by taking a look at these two diagrams, pushing some formulas together, we can get our proof of this inclusion exclusion principle. And this can be extended to more than just two events. So let's see this in action. So let's say that the event A is having a visa and the event B is having a MasterCard, if you want to put this in context, and we have some probabilities. What we know is that P of A is equal to 0.5, P of B is equal to 0.4, and P of A intersection B is equal to 
I'm writing this list again because we might need to use some other tools. In fact, let's put this to use right away. What is the probability of P A bar? That's going to be 1 minus the probability of P of A, so it's going to be 0.5. What is the probability of P of B bar? Well, 1 minus 0 0.4 is 0 0.6. And then, uh, just for fun, what is the probability of A intersection B bar? 1 minus 0 0.25, which gives us 0 0.75. My notation sometimes changes depending on whether I have a bunch of things being not or just one, so you'll see both. Okay, the first says compute the probability of A union B. So we know this is going to be PA plus PB minus PA intersection B. So this will give us 0.5 plus 0.4 minus 0.25 be 0.9 minus 0.25, which is 0.65. Now we need to compute the probability of not A union B. So this is going to be 1 minus the probability of A union B, putting our second proof into use here, which is 1 minus 0.65, and this gives us 0.35. Okay, the last task might be a little bit more work. But we can see we want to compute the probability of A and not B. So how are we going to do this one? Well, we're going to use that information from before with our little diagrams. So let's just draw this out so we can see it. The probability of A intersection B bar is just going to be this bit right here. So what we need to do is we need to find P A and we need to subtract P of A intersection B. And that's going to give us our solution here. So this is going to be 0.5 minus 0.25. So the probability of P of A and not B is just going to be 0.25. So that one maybe took a little bit more mental effort to do, but having pictures really tends to help with these problems. So if you have any questions, you know what to do.